Hello, this is Vincent Stacy Sadowski from Two Weeks in a Hammock, and we are so happy to be here with you tonight at Quiet Adventure Symposium. We are going to be presenting on North Manitou Island, so let me share my screen and we will get started. Wilderness Within Reach, Planning Your Visit to North Manitou Island. And this presentation is by Vincent Stacy Sadowski of TwoWeeksInAHammock.com. That's us. And that's us. Visiting North Manitou Island. Today we're going to talk about why North Manitou, before you go, how to get there, what to expect in safety, a little bit of island history, some popular destinations, hikes and hidden gems, leave no trace principles, and the spirit of the Manitou. Um, I'm Vince, uh, and I've been camping on North Manitou Island for over 20 years. I've uh, been there probably 30 sometimes, often several times a year, uh, sometimes for two weeks at a time. I've been uh, solo and also uh, camping with other people. And I'm Stacy, I'm married to Vince, and we met on North Manitou Island. I've been coming to Manitou Island for about 10 years now and been doing volunteer work with. Um, Preserve Historic Sleeping Bear doing some historic preservation work on the island. And after I met Vince, I became a backcountry camper. Before I ever visited the island, I read a memoir by one of the island residents, Rita Hadra Rusko, called North Manitou Island Between Sunrise and Sunset. And when I came to the island for the first time, it was like stepping into a book I've read. It was a magical experience and we wanna share that with you tonight. So wilderness, most of the land on North Manitou Island is federally designated wilderness. This is a level of protection by the federal government that um, when you go as a visitor, this will impact your experience because you are not able to bring pets, have any kind of wheeled vehicles, any kind of motorized vehicles. So everything is on foot travel. And um, this creates a very wonderful, peaceful environment for visiting. And what this uh, also means for your backpacking is that once you leave the village area uh, where the buildings and ranger station are, uh, there is one campground that's in the village, um, but everything else outside is wilderness. There aren't any right. campgrounds. So you have to camp in the wilderness uh, just without any campgrounds. The Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore is in um, northern Lower Peninsula, Michigan, as you can see here in this image, it, it has 72,000, over 72,000 acres of land and North and South Manitou are part of that area along with some on the mainland as well. And so what we're gonna be talking about tonight is just North Manitou Island, but you can also visit South. Um, this picture in the upper right is one of the iconic images from the mainland from the Empire Bluff Trail. And that would be a very popular image that you see on a lot of um, brochures and flyers and websites as well. Mm -hmm. uh, North Manitou Island is about 12 miles from Leland. It's about a one hour boat ride. The island is seven miles long, four and a half miles wide, has about 25 miles of shoreline and uh, it's about 15,000 acres or 22 square miles. And this is a map of the island that you get when you come as a camper. And you can also find this online as well. And so we're gonna be talking about some of the destinations on the map tonight. But before you go. Well, first you have to get there. So uh, most people get there uh, by the ferry boat. Uh, Manitou Island Transit is the ferry service and it runs uh, from May into September. And uh, the website manitoutransit.com is where you can go online and place your reservations. And tickets are available now um, for summer. And you also will need to think about making your reservations in advance. They even fill up. They fill up, yep. And so you can, get, you can get tickets during the summer season, but they may not be at the preferred times that you want if you're looking for holidays or if you have a large group. And uh, there's also going to be some uh, park fees. So you have to have a um, park pass. Uh, and there's also every night uh, nightly camping fees. And uh, one other fee is uh, parking for your car um, on the mainland. 
Yep, and all of these fees you can pay other than the reservations you make online ahead of time, which you actually pay for the, the boat ticket at that time. Once you arrive, you can, you can pay the other fees as well. And the fees are pretty reasonable. Um, you can check those online. You can do the whole trip per person easily under, easily under $100, depending on the number of nights you're camping. But also check out the National Park Service website at the bottom there for seasonal alerts and advisories because sometimes conditions change and there may be different rules or things you need to consider as you go, but always check that in advance. And this here is the ticket office that sits in Leland. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this isn't a, a presentation on how to camp. Uh, we figure you know that already, but uh, just real quick, I do. Or you can learn elsewhere. Or you can learn yeah. elsewhere. And uh, um, I generally break my gear down into four general categories, uh, food, shelter, clothing, and tools. And uh, food for Manitou Island, because you get there by a ferry boat, uh, there can be delays because of weather or other you know, scheduling emergencies. Uh, so you should always plan on having an extra two days worth of food, uh, just in case. Um, water. You do not have to pack all of your water onto the island. There are two um, pumps, uh, faucets uh, by the dock where you can initially fill up. But once you start hiking, uh, the there is no other water other than natural sources. So Lake Michigan, and there's two inland lakes, and there's a couple uh, springs that you might find. So. Um, you have to filter your water, uh, especially Lake Michigan. Um, clothing, make sure that you're prepared for all kinds of weather. Uh, things are a little cooler on the island than on the mainland, um, so be prepared. Um, shelter, well, whatever, whatever uh, you like. Uh, tools, navigation. Um, you definitely want to have, if you're old school, map and compass, know how to use them or you can uh, use a GPS on your cell phone. Um, download the maps first, because when you're, when you're on the island, likely you will not have cell service. Right, you can't rely on that. And this picture here is um, our hammock setup. So we do a hammock camp up to two weeks at a time out on the island, and um, we have got a very comfortable setup. Let's mention <laughs> that a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's not ultra light by any means, um, but it is built for comfort. Uh, the hammock, uh, we sleep in it together. It's a pretty heavyweight hammock, 13 feet long. It's a tablecloth, actually. Um, 13 feet by seven and a half feet and a um, waterproof tarp above with bug netting all the way around. So it's almost like being in a, in a tent. Um, yep. And then we have an underquilt also. Underquilt that, that keeps to keep us warm. warm. Yep. Yep. Okay. So how to get there? Other than the ferry, you can also get there by private boat or by sea kayak. And you should only be sea kayaking if you are very experienced, know what you're doing. The lake conditions can be very dangerous, change quickly. And these images are in the dock area and on the boat. And when you arrive, you can drop off your, um, your gear at the dock and go park your car, which will be several blocks away. So you wanna make sure that you arrive early to do that, to allow for time for that. Um, most people just leave their packs there. Nobody's gonna mess with them or touch them, it's fine. And you go and park your car or send one person in your group back to park your car and you're gonna walk back a few blocks. Yeah, generally don't park your car until after you've checked in after because you, check you in. have to get the parking permit, which goes in your dash, so. Exactly, yeah. Okay, and when you arrive on North Manitou Island, you're gonna arrive, um, you'll see where the arrow is, that's where the dock is. And once you arrive, you um, unload on the, onto the dock. What we usually do is form a pack line, depending on the number of people when the boat is very full. We have a pack line, kind of like the bucket, big, bucket brigade, brigade. <laughs> where um, people pass off packs. And so you yeah. were able to unload the packs pretty quickly that way. Then everybody goes um, up to the, up to the registration area for orientation before being um, orientation and camper check-in before being released to go camping. Yeah, the uh, ranger will sign your uh, your camping permit, and you'll get that back to you after the orientation. And you need to have the camping permit with you, so make sure that you do. You have to attend the orientation; it's mandatory. Yeah, and that's 
and it's a pretty wide open space. So you're not going to get away. They're going to, they're going to corral you over there and do the orientation. (laughs) And some of the things they'll talk about include leave no trace. So it's very important on the Island. There's a fragile ecosystem. Um, We want to have the Island last for generations to come. As I mentioned before, it's federally protected wilderness. Everything on the Island is protected rocks, plants, artifacts. You cannot take anything away from the Island. Although you can eat the apples, the berries, um, leeks, if you have a Michigan fishing license, you can fish. So those things can be eaten, but you don't, you can't take more than what you can actually consume while you're there. There's historic sites on the island. Do not enter any of the buildings or ruins and do not remove any of the artifacts that are there, but they're really fun to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as safety goes, the first rule of the safety is to consider that you're far away from the mainland. You're at least two hours away from help. So you want to be very careful in everything you do in the event you have an emergency you need to call 911 and um, not everywhere on the island has good cell phone coverage. There is cell phone coverage along the Eastern shore of the island and around the South part of the island, some parts on the Western shore, a lot of central parts without cell coverage. So it's pretty hit or miss. And you may need to get to an area where you can make a phone call. Um, Mm. This building in the picture here is the ranger station and you can go to the ranger station um if you go there they'll call 911 so they do the same thing that you would but if you're looking for someone you know just for help that is also a resource yeah and the ranger might not be there so don't don't count on it uh, he might be somewhere else on the island patrolling or right um so uh, definitely call 911 yourself as soon as you can And on the island, you also need to be aware of poison ivy, ticks, swimmers itch. So come prepared for those things. Um, There's a lot of poison ivy, but it's pretty easy to avoid if you're watching for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Ticks are always a concern, but no, doesn't seem to be any worse than anywhere else we visit in Michigan. And you need to protect yourself with spray or like, you know, covering your ankles. So look into ways to be prepared for that. There's swimmers itch in Lake Manitou, the largest of the two inland lakes. So if you, if you do swim there, you need to rub yourself off briskly when you come out. Uh, so camping spots, um, you can camp almost anywhere on the island outside of the village, uh, except in the village, there is one campground that has, I think it's eight sites. Um, there's generally a hundred people camping on the island or more. Uh, most people do not camp in the village campground. Um, there wouldn't be room for everybody. So uh, when you are out in the wilderness, you need to make sure that you are 300 feet away from any water source, uh, 300 feet away from any other camping groups, and 300 feet away from any historic structures. Um, and uh, your camping group is generally going to be limited to four people. And over the course of the summer, over 4,000 people visit the island. So there are a lot of people there, even though you may not see very many while you're there because it's a large space. You cannot have any fires on the island except in the village campground. There are three community fire rings. Uh, That is the only place you can have fires, no other fires anywhere on the island. And violations of either the camping spot rules or the fires, these are things that you can get a hefty ticket for because they do have rangers patrolling the island. So you wanna, of course, follow those rules. Yeah, Uh, you can have a cook stove, of course, uh, but not a wood burning stove. So you can cook. Um, Trash, make sure that you pack it out. Uh, Do not leave your trash laying around. You do not have to pack it off the island. There are garbage dumpsters uh, by the dock that you can leave your stuff on your way out. Um, uh, Bury your human waste. Uh, Do not not leave that laying around, Uh, no toilet paper. Um, Please leave the island nice for all of us. Um, So water, there's water in the village by the registration mm -hmm. building. When you arrive, as we mentioned, also you need to be able to filter water while you're there. And there um, is the springs, Lake Michigan, Lake Manitou available for you for that. For food safety, 
there are chipmunks on the island, which, <laughs> micro bears, micro bears, which can and will get into your food if they're able to. So you're going to want to hang your food off of the ground if, at least a few feet. Yeah, there are not any bears, so you don't have to worry about bear. You don't have to worry about raccoons. But the chipmunks, you still need to take precautions against. Yes, and in the in the um, registration building, there is a Starvin Marvin box, as you can see in the <laughs> picture here. And that is a place where campers will leave behind extra food. So if you end up finding, if you find yourself stranded on the island because of a boat delay and you don't have enough food, you can go tap into this box and look for some snacks. Now, wildlife on the island, leave no trace principle, do not disturb the wildlife, do not feed them. They're very tame. Some of the the deer that you'll see will walk right up to you. Mm -hmm. um, they will walk up and they may lick your pants if you've got like salt on your hands and rub it on your pants. So they they will also come around your campsite at night um, looking for places where you might have gone off to relieve yourself. And so you need to be aware that they, they are around and, and make sure not to disturb them or interact with them too much. Um, there's also chipmunks, there's coyotes. If you're fortunate, Fortunate, you will hear the coyotes at night in some areas of the island, but for the most part, you will be unlikely to see them. Yeah, and yeah, you don't have to worry about the coyotes. Um, and uh, please be quiet. Uh, remember, this is a wilderness island and everyone comes there to feel like they are the only person there and just to enjoy the peace and quiet. Yes, and one other thing on the island um, that you need to know about is the piping plovers, which are an endangered mm -hmm. shorebird. And this picture is courtesy of the National Park Service website. Um, I did not take that photo, but the rest of the photos in this presentation are ours. Um, the piping plovers are endangered and they are in a recovery program. Their nesting areas on the island are blocked off with a lot of signage. So if you're there um, between, mid late May until mid August, their mm -hmm. areas will be blocked off. And um, those include some of the areas near the main dock and also um, down in the Southern end of the island. So the island history, um, when you go around the island, you'll see that currently no one lives there year round. Um, the only people that are there in the summertime are Park Service staff and volunteers, as well as um, there are a couple properties on the island still privately owned, but no one is there year round. And so any sites that you see, if you see place names on the map, these are places that um, used to be where homes or homesteads were, and some of them have buildings. Some of them just have um, artifacts or remnants of buildings there. And so what you need to know was that originally the Native American population was there on the island exclusively. Um, and that was exclusively pre 1850 ish. Um, once you get into the 1850s to 1920s, we have the logging area, which had a huge impact on the island. But also there were summer residents who came up from Chicago and built the Cottage Row era or area um, near the main dock. And that is in the village. There was also a lot of farming that took place on the island. And that persisted into even the 1970s with some of the logging operations and such. Um, the Park Service took over the island in um, around 1983, 84, when they purchased the land and then opened it up. So the Park Service was initiated in 1970 and it took a while for them to purchase all of the properties. Uh, destinations, where to go. Uh, the maintained trail, uh, there's two loops, the north and the south loop forming a figure eight. Um, a lot of campers, especially if you're there just for a short time and you've never been there, they go straight from the dock across the island to the west side and set up camp by the uh, former site of Crescent. And uh, if you do that, you will not be alone. There will be a lot of other campers there. Um, hard to find a campsite possibly. So if you have a little more ambition, keep hiking a little further. Yeah, well, hard to find a privacy at a campsite. Privacy, I mean, there's, right. <laughs> there's plenty of places to be, but if you want to be alone, um, the city of Crescent's not the place for that. You're right, it, it can be kind of crowded. Um, about a, what is about a half a mile north of the, a quarter mile north of the dock is the village campground in, in the village. 
And uh, like I said earlier, that has, I think, eight campsites. Um, so it, it's not a bad place to stay, you know, maybe your last night if you want to be close to the boat. But generally, that's not where you want to plan on camping. Right. There's much more to see. And so we want to talk to you about that tonight and tell you about some of our favorite places. The map on the left is actually a map I made myself. These are from GPS track logs. Um, this is where I have actually hiked myself all over the island. Um, there's lots of old hidden roads, uh, forgotten um, properties. Uh, you can even come across some old uh, house ruins and other structures. Um, lots, lots of things to see. So if you think that you're just going to get to the island and you hike the two main loops and think you've been everywhere, done it all, seen it all, no, you missed yeah, the whole but... island. <laughs> right. I've been going there for over 20 years. And every time I go there, I still see something new. So there's a lot to explore. Absolutely. So on the east side, some of the main features here are, of course, the dock where you'll arrive and the village campgrounds. So you can see that kind of on the northern edge in this circle. And then the village consists of some buildings that are um, historical structures, Cottage Row, which was the summer resident area. There's a sawmill, life-saving complex, and of course, the ranger station. And the area around the village is the only area on the island that's not considered wilderness or protected under that designation. So these are some pictures of Cottage Row, which um, was built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of these structures, and um, they are currently under renovation and will hopefully someday be open for the public to see inside. And this is um, an image coming from the village campground down toward the main area in the village. And on the left here is one of the large barn structures that was part of the um, Manitou Island Association agricultural years. Then we have the life-saving complex, which is the, the collection of buildings near the dock. And there is one building there, um, second from the right, which is open to the public, which is a boathouse and it has a historic boat in it and some information. Um, and most of these buildings are used by Park Service staff and volunteers during the summer. And then the dock on the right is the dock you would arrive on. There's the boat. The boat is the Mishimokwa, which is the um, mother bear. And currently the sand is filled in around the north side of the dock. So in this image, it would be on the left side. And so when you go there this summer, you'll see a lot more sand. Yep. And It'll it, look a lot different. Yep, and it um, ends up getting washed in every winter. And so they have to frequently dredge out the dock area to keep it clear for the boats. So on the south side, the features there are the cemetery, Bernique Farm, Stormer Place. This is where the, in my opinion, the best beaches are, mm -hmm. Fredrickson's Place and Johnson's Place. Um, this is my personal favorite area of the island. Um, it's got a lot of low open areas that where it's open to the water, easy access to the beaches, a lot of um, beautiful rolling hills and dunes. Um, the cemetery area is in the green circle there along with Bernique's. The area in the red circle is where the piping plover um, restricted area is. So you will not be able to hike around that tip of the island or explore in that area if you go there um, within the nesting season, which would be on um, this map says May 1st to August 15th. All right, so if you wanted to uh, explore the, that southern beach, uh, you probably have to cut all the way over to the west side and then go down south around that way. Yeah, and so this is this is one of the structures Bernique's place. This actually sits in the wilderness area and um, it has been recently um, renovated by the Park Service or restored. And so it is not open to the public, but you can peek in the windows and this was built by a Chicago, Chicago family that would come up in the summers. Um, the cemetery over here on the right is one of the most beautiful cemeteries I've ever visited. It's a very peaceful place. Um, the sign in the foreground says cemetery, but you can see that, but the sign that's further back, the larger one, lists the um, people who are buried there in the cemetery. A lot of the 
settlers who were there. And um, it's got kind of these fence posts and some fencing around it. And it's in a, in a very um, pretty rolling hill area. It's not very large and you just kind of wander through and among the, the tall grass and the ferns, there are graves here and there. It's definitely a place worth checking out. Um, on the uh, west side of the island. Southwest. Southwest. So you're still southish. Right. Um, Fredrickson Place is um, a nice open clearing now. It used to be a homestead. Um, uh, most of the people that used to camp here, their campsites were too close to the water. So don't go and camp just because it looks like other people have camped there. You do have to be 300 feet away from the water and they are enforcing that more now and you don't want to get a ticket. And it's not 300 feet straight up the bluff. It's 300 feet. 300 feet uh, horizontally. Horizontally, yes. yeah. Yep, and this has got this has got kind of a steep bluff down to the water um, on this and this particular spot. So it can be, um, depending on the erosion levels, it can be a little harder in some areas to get down. Um, this one is a little bit iffy right now, so you might have to go down a little ways to get to the beach, or mm -hmm. plan on you know sending the youngest person in your group down to get water. And come right. back up. <laughs> but you just have to take a, a close look when you get there. Like, okay, can we get back up here? Um, yeah. This other this other spot on the right is the beach near the cemetery area, and this is a very beautiful spot near where where a place where we used to like we usually like to camp. Mm -hmm. and there's is, lots of good camping out. Lots of good there. camping down there, um, and we this is where we like to sit and watch the sunrise and, and drink our coffee in the morning. The Stormer Place is an example of some of the ruins that you may encounter. This is. This is in the woods, so you have to like really um, search for it or look at some of the old maps that may mark it more clearly where it is. But it was um, a farmstead that was out there that um, is obviously in ruins and you wanna be very careful around these structures not to enter them. Um, watch out for rusty nails, rusty nails broken, um, yeah, broken there's... glass, broken mm -hmm. artifacts. So just be really cautious exploring. On the left is uh, Old Baldy. This is the uh, high point on the south side of the island. And from the shoreline, it is about a mile to the top of the sand dune. And from the top, it's just a beautiful view. Um, generally, if you do hike it, you'll be alone. Uh, most people uh, don't get up there. Um, and on the, the picture on the right is uh, where the lighthouse used to stand. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so this is the area where the lighthouse ruins are. And we went there one year after the piping clover restrictions were done for the summer. So this would have been late August. And um, if you're there that late in the year, you can go down. And if you look for the telephone pole that's out there by itself, there's a row of telephone poles. If you go to the last one um, in that area, you can find some bricks and some artifacts from the lighthouse that used to stand there. Yep. On the uh, southeast side, the beach is, um, it's just a beautiful beach. It's very shallow on the south side of the island. In fact, there's a, a lighthouse quite a ways out that's only in about 30 feet of water is how shallow that is. Um, picture on the right, <laughs> that's me one couple of years ago. Uh, according to the map, I was still on the island, but the water levels had come up that high and it is a very gradual, uh, shallow area. So they came inland quite a bit. Yeah, and so he's pointing to where <laughs> Donner's Point is the um, the lower western corner of the island, the south southwestern corner. And mm -hmm. he's pointing to where Donner's Point is, which was still out deeper <laughs> into the water that year. But yeah, the beaches you'll see are just expansive and wide open and you are not going to see other people it's um for the most part like we rarely see other people when we're out there and we just really enjoy that kind of solitude and, and the water is beautiful and the water looks in this picture on the right as you can see it's crystal clear okay on the west side of the island um you, if you hike straight over, uh, that's one way, or you can take either of the um, halves of the figure eight loop to get here. 
the former site of Crescent. Crescent used to be a lumbering town. Uh, you will find a lot of uh, artifacts there, um, especially the biggest one is Swenson's Barn. It's um, quite a big barn to see. Um, and about three miles south of that is Johnson's Place. And about another mile south of that is Fredrickson's Place, which we showed you a picture of in the previous slides. Yeah, because it's toward the southern end. And if you like sunsets, this is your this is your side of the island to go. It's the sunsets cannot be beat over here. It's even a nice place to meet a nice girl and make a proposal. That's right. That's where we <laughs> that's where we got engaged. Vince proposed to me at Crescent, looking at the um, the sunset. And it was a beautiful night. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the site of Crescent. Um, there, like as been said, there are some artifacts in a couple buildings there near the barn area. But for the most part, you've got these rolling hills, the dune overlooking the lake. And there's a lot of social trails throughout here because we said it's a very popular place to, to tent camp. So a lot of people come out there and, and do that. So you want to if you're going to be in that area, just know that you're not going to be alone if you are out in Crescent. Um, you notice this, especially at, at sunset, when the, the sun starts to go down, a lot of people start to come out of the woodwork and watch mm -hmm. the sunset together. Um, Fredrickson's Place, this is, a, this is an example of some of the signage. A lot of the, the place names you see on the map are, are clearings or um, just spots that were where a farm used to be. So this is what you'd see at Fredrickson's place. Right, unless you're really exploring for artifacts and ruins, uh, probably all you're gonna see is a clearing with a sign. And on the left, this is actually part of the old dock that uh, is at Crescent. And in the last couple of years, the water level has been high and you can't uh, see the pilings anymore. But uh, they're there under the water, so you know, be careful if you're swimming. But uh, and um, picture on the right shows some of the steeper uh, descents down to the lake might be um, lined with logs to create steps going down. Uh, a lot of the places, though, there aren't anything, and so it's uh, it can be quite a chore to get back up. So think about that before you go down. <laughs> so on the north side of the island, there's the Molesky Place, which is another old farm site with some ruins, the outlet in the pole bridge, Stormer Camp, Davenport Camp, Potholes, and the Old Grade. Now, um, the outlet in the pole bridge, that is the, um, the inland lake you see in the center of the map here, leads to a swampy area to the, to the right, which leads out to Lake Michigan in a creek. And so that is called the outlet. That's what the creek is. And the arrow is where the outlet actually comes out onto Lake Michigan. Um, and the pole bridge is a little bridge over that swampy area on the main trail, which has got the dotted line. And the stormer camps and Davenport camps are old logging camps where there's a lot of artifacts. And the potholes, that's an area that's a um, geologic formation. It looks like, like three fingers were stuck down into the island. They're very deep, deep, um, large potholes. When you stand on the edge of them, you need to be careful because it's extremely steep. They're hard to hike to, and there's no direct trail that goes there um, that's easy to find. But a lot of people try to go out and to check that out. It's a rigorous hike. So if you're going to do that, you need to know that in advance. And on this whole northern edge, there is um, this is a higher elevation. So there are very steep bluffs down to Lake Michigan from here. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not the place you want to have to go get water on this end of the island. Um, the whole upper left-hand side of this image is elevated. And so there's a, mar a markation on there that says the old grade. That used to be an old train track area. It's now part of the main trail which they used for um, hauling logs. So it goes on a steep area up there and then down toward the Davenport camp. Um, also on the trail, if you look to the south, this is on the northernmost part of the trail. Uh, there is an old, we call it the junkyard, a lot of old um, trucks and cars that were used 
during the uh, logging and other times on the island. And uh, you can check out some of those remains. Uh, leave everything there, of course. Be careful walking, but check it out and take pictures. Trilliums. In the, the trillium. In the in the spring, we like to go camp in May before there's a lot of visitors and before the, the trees leaf out. It's really a beautiful place to go. It's a little cooler then. Um, but the trillium come out in May and they are just fantastically beautiful. You can see that all over northern Michigan, but um, to see that on the island is, is quite a treat. And on the right is a picture of some of the steep bluffs on the north edge of the island. And hiking the outlet. So this last that. year, yeah, this <laughs> last year when we went there, we um, went to where the outlet creek comes down to the beach and we hiked in this little valley. Um, we hiked right up the creek and, you know, with our shoes off and enjoyed the sandy bottom in the creek and had a really just a beautiful, beautiful hike through there. Um, and the picture on the right, you can see um, I'm coming up the creek and you can see Lake Michigan behind me. Um, as we as we go and this this goes all the way up to the pole bridge area and you can you can go quite a distance on this mm -hmm. um, but again you want to really make sure you've got good navigation um, when you hike some of these places off trail uh, interior lakes um, lake manitou is the larger of the two inland lakes and that's about a mile long and a quarter mile across. Tamarack Lake is the more southern one and maybe a quarter mile across, um, both beautiful lakes. Tamarack Lake can be difficult to get to. Um, Lake Manitou is easy to get to. There's uh, maintained trails, two of them going to it. Um, and then there's a couple farms and orchards. You wanna... Yeah, the Frank Farm, um, you can see that on the upper right there and the orchards, there's some, there are a lot of old apple trees throughout, throughout the island at some of the old farmsteads. If you don't find buildings, you may find apple trees or pear trees. And um, this particular area does have some of these really old trees that are just really beautiful to see, old gnarly mm -hmm. apple trees mm -hmm. with, with fruit still growing on them. Um, the Carlson Place is um, just south of that, but it's on a different trail. It's on the trail that goes across the island, the dotted line there. And there are some ruins there as well as some agricultural clearings. And then um, throughout the rest of this, you know, what you saw earlier on the map that, that Vince had created with a lot of his hiking over time, um, there are a lot of old logging roads and trails on the island that are, you know, kind of lost to time. And when you get back there and start to find them, they're very, um, very fun to, to hike down. But Lake Manitou, so mm, that's this, a gem. <laughs> this picture on the left is taken at Fisk Landing as a, we were with a, a group of volunteers and we hiked out for the afternoon. And it's a nice wide open clearing right there on the edge of the lake. It's just a beautiful spot. A lot of people like to camp over near Lake Manitou, but again, remember you've got to be 300, 300 feet, feet back from the water when you camp. And on the right, that's a picture of the sun setting over Lake Manitou. It's a, yeah, it's a very beautiful place. Beautiful. Uh, Tamarack Lake is, like I said, um, the smaller, more Southern Lake, uh, difficult to get to because there are no maintained trails to it. Um, there are beaver in this lake and the picture on the right is the largest tree I have ever seen uh, that was brought down by beaver. And it's, it's a lot of fun just to watch them swim back and forth across the lake. Uh, they're probably wondering what you're doing, taking pictures of them. <laughs> yeah, and that lower that lower picture is, is a beaver in the water. And on the left, um, this picture was taken in May. So the, the vegetation hadn't grown in. When we've hiked uh, to Tamarack Lake at other times of year, the vegetation is like shoulder or head high right here. So it can be hard to get to the water edge and to see the water as well if you're there later in the season, but you can still see above the, the weeds. But mm -hmm. this, this picture makes it look very wide open, but that was in May. Yeah. Some of the old log, uh, old roads, logging roads. Yeah, so the picture on the left was taken um, more than a hundred years ago by Edward Beebe, who was a, a postcard photographer who came to North Manitou and did a series of pictures. But you can see there that that's what the roads looked like 
a hundred years ago um, in some spots. And the other images are what some of the roads look like now. Now these are all trails that are more maintained, um, except for in the upper right, that's, that's an unmaintained trail. Um, that's the Stormer Camp Trail mm -hmm. area, but it's, there's a lot of trees that come down throughout the year. And every spring, the Park Service sends a couple of um, maintenance people out on a crew to hike with chainsaws. And they get a special permit to do that within the wilderness area. And they come and clear the main maintained trails and they cut the logs. But um, this picture on the lower right is, is a tree that came down mid season. So you may still encounter some um, logs and this was actually this is a little hard one harder to get over because you <laughs> yeah, have to kind of, you can't really walk around it because it's in this little um in this valley road rut right and, and then you have to kind of climb over it and it's not quite high enough to go under it's a little uncomfortable to go over so that's the kind of thing that you can run across there as well but a lot of the main trail looks wide open um and the older roads still look like this they'll just have different trees down over them or um, in some areas like small saplings have grown up mm -hmm. so leave no trace seven principles i just want to take a moment here to talk about leave no trace um, in general and these are the seven main um, ideas one is to plan ahead and prepare what you're doing by watching this presentation so you're learning about where you're going to go so that you know to make good choices ahead of time when you go to a location, you want to travel and camp on durable surfaces. Um, and that would include things like try not to trample on um, dune grass, for example, because that holds the sand in place. It keeps the dunes from blowing out. Um, dispose of waste properly. That includes taking, packing out your trash, burying your human waste, and making sure that you're not leaving toilet paper laying around. We do see, unfortunately, a lot of that when we're out and about. Um, and leave what you find. Don't, um, don't take anything with you and minimize campfire impacts in general, but on North Manitou, no fires. Unless you find other people's garbage, uh, please do pick that up and yes, take that please, with you. Yeah, take other people's garbage out with you if you find it. Um, but yeah, so there's no fires on the island except for in the village campground in the fire rings. Um, respect wildlife. Make sure that you give them their distance. Don't feed them. Be considerate of other visitors. Be quiet. Um, if you're going to listen to music, use um, ear pods or earbuds. Um, and some of these other pictures are things that we've seen on North Manitou. And in the upper right, we've seen a couple of structures like this where someone has taken like driftwood or things on the beach mm -hmm. because the stuff does wash up on the beaches. And they kind of built a chair using rope and stuff, which is, you know, kind of clever, kind of neat, but it ruins the wilderness aesthetic. When you, when you walk up, you think you're out in the middle of nowhere, and then you see something mm -hmm. someone built. Right. <laughs> and it, you know, and then it becomes, you know, an eyesore. And the same thing with the carns. A lot of people believe that the rock stacking is no big deal, but really, again, that's disturbing um, the environment, the visual aesthetic for the other campers behind you. And in some locations can actually cause problems when you move rocks around. Um, unless they're rocks that are specifically marking a trail. On the, on the right side, you see um, there are ax cut marks on a large tree. Yep, and for, for no good reason. For, just... no, for no good reason. And so that's just destructive. And on the lower left side was an abandoned campsite that, that we found that um, had like garbage and bottles in it. Like somebody just completely left that behind. So so when you go to North Manitou Island, please, please um, take good care of the island while you're there. Um, we, it's a very special place to us and to a lot of people that we know, and we want to make sure that it stays that way for a long time. So with the increasing visitors that are coming to the island, this is becoming more and more important. So lastly, the spirit of the Manitou. Um, Rita Hedra Rusco, author and historian, in her book said, those claimed by the spirit of the Manitou will always yearn to return. And this is the island, looking at the island off the back of the boat going home. So we hope that when you go, that the spirit of the Manitou claims you as well. So enjoy your visit. Thank you for um, watching our presentation today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. and. Um, have a great trip to North Manitou Island. Take care.